start with a couple of interesting similarities. So oftentimes when you hear uh, early modern philosophy talked about, you hear it talked about as though there are two camps. There are the rationalists on the one side and the epistemolog or epistemologists and the empiricists on the other side, and they're always in disagreement about everything. Um, I, I don't think that those are totally unhelpful categories. I'm going to refer to them sometimes. Uh, but I want to start by pointing out just how similar the projects are if you take the sort of the flagship person from each camp, which is Descartes on the one side and Locke on the other. Uh, so the first goal that uh, Descartes uh, articulates, the beginning of the meditations, is he wants to sort out which of his preconceived ideas are good ones versus which ones are bad. Uh, so some years ago, I was struck by the large number of falsehoods that I had accepted as true in my childhood and by the highly doubtful nature of the whole edifice that I had subsequently based on them. Okay, so that's Descartes. We'll take a look at what Locke is saying here. I shall not have wholly misemployed myself if I can give an account of the ways whereby our understandings come to attain those notions of the things we have and can set down any measures of the certainty of our knowledge or the grounds of those persuasions which are to be found amongst men so various, different, and wholly contradictory, and yet asserted somewhere or other with such assurance and confidence that he shall take a view of the opinions of mankind, observe their opposition, and at the same time consider the fondness and devotion wherewith they are embraced, the resolution and eagerness wherewith they are maintained, may perhaps have reason to suspect that either there is no such thing as truth at all, or that mankind has no sufficient means to attain certain knowledge of it. See, so this is, a, this is a common project that both Descartes and Locke are looking at. They want to look at the ideas that they hold, the ideas that they have been taught, and they want to figure out which ones are true and which ones are false. A second common project uh, is that both of them, uh, and this is sort of maybe a larger way of saying the th same thing, they both want to demarcate what the bounds of human knowledge are. So what is it that we can know and what is it that we should just leave off trying to know because it's beyond our comprehension? So again, Descartes, if, however, I simply refrain from making a judgment in cases where I do not perceive the truth with sufficient clarity and distinctness, there it is clear that I'm behaving correctly and avoiding error. But if in such cases I either affirm or deny that I'm not using my free will correctly. So there's a demarcation that Descartes is trying to draw and he's trying to give you a, a real line in the sand for here are the things we can know and if you're in this camp then do everything you can to know them. Those things over there, those are beyond what we can know. And if you go that far, you're just stepping into error. Your will is exceeding your capacity. That's the way that Descartes is going to describe it. Uh, and here we have Locke saying exactly the same thing. And this is right at the outset of his project. It's therefore worthwhile to search out the bounds between opinion and knowledge and to examine by what measures, in things whereof we have no certain knowledge, we ought to regulate our assent and moderate our persuasions. So there's a commonality between both Descartes and Locke's projects. They're both going on the same journey, and, and it seems like for fairly similar reasons. They both noticed that there are beliefs that they hold and that their friends hold and that their whole community holds that maybe aren't justified, that maybe aren't true, and they want to know, okay, well, which of these are true and which of them are false? And more generally, what kinds of things can I know and what kinds of things can't I know? So that's the, that's the project, that's the sort of the, the thing that sets uh, sail to these ships. And the question is, why is this a concern that both Descartes and Locke are having at the same time in basically the same way? Um, there are lots of reasons for that, there are lots of good answers to this question. I'm just going to talk about three of them that I think are, are uh, fairly good indicators for why this particular question becomes so salient at this moment in history. Uh, so the first one of them is uh, there are important scientific advances that have just happened, like literally almost contemporarily to Descartes, that are kind of rocking the way that people think about the world. Um, mainly, there's a telescope and there's a microscope. So we figure out lens technology at about this time. And you wouldn't think that figuring out lens technology would be that big a deal. But it is. <laughs> Why is that? Well, a couple of reasons. The first is uh, when, you, when you use lenses and you point them outwards, you get a real sense for what the universe is like, and it's way different than we thought, right? So Galileo gets uh, empirical evidence that now is, is uh, proving Copernicus's theory that the universe is not geocentric, right? I, we are not in the center of this universe. The universe is way, 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 way bigger than we thought it was. And we don't really know where we are in relation to its center, right? It's, it's just so different from what we had imagined. 
Well, at the same time, that same lens is turned uh, down onto the microscopic. And we discover that there's a whole world that we have never even imagined exists at the microscopic level. So if you imagine this, it's, it's a bit like the whole universe uh, exploded in two directions at once. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite ways of talking about this is, is through a quote from Pascal. Um, so, so Pascal talks about us being caught between these dual infinities. Uh, and he calls this the disproportion of man. Man doesn't have the right proportion with relationship to his universe. Uh, so, so I'll just read this quote to you. Whoever looks at himself in this way with respect to these, to these dual infinities will be terrified by himself and thinking himself supported by the size nature has given us, suspended between the two gulfs of the infinite and the void, will tremble at nature's wonders. I believe that our curiosity turning to admiration, we will be more disposed to contemplate them in silence than arrogantly search them out. For in the end, what is humanity in nature? A nothingness compared to the infinite, everything in compared to a nothingness, a midpoint between nothing and everything, infinitely far from understanding the extremes. So, so for Pascal, this is going to be a, a problem for knowledge generally. He says, if we, could, if we could get up to the point where we can understand the biggest things, like if we, if we could sort of, we're proportionally able to get to the, the big end of the universe, we would be able to understand it. If we could get to the small end of the universe, we would be able to understand it. But we can't. We're just this sort of medium-sized thing in this universe that extends infinitely in two directions. And trying to grasp at either side is kind of impossible from this perspective. We're simultaneously too big and too small to get a grasp on the universe. So, so one of the reasons why I think both Locke and Descartes come into this era thinking, OK, we got to get clear on what we can know is it just became clear that there are a whole lot of things we didn't know and maybe can't know that would be essential for really understanding where we are in this universe and what we're doing here. It's just, it's just a, a much bigger, much, much more, uh, uh, I guess, disorienting project than we thought it was. OK, so that's one thing. Um, another thing is that there's a, there's a resurgence of skeptical thought right around this time. And there's lots of figures I could talk about. I'm just going to focus on one. Uh, his name is Michel de Montaigne. Uh, so he's a French guy. He's a little bit before Descartes. Um, and he writes two essays in particular that, in different ways, pose a real challenge to the possibility of certain knowledge. Uh, the first one is called On Cannibals. Um, and I, I don't know if any of you in here were in the Tempest sessions I just read, but uh, they're, they're really fun, actually, references to Montaigne in Shakespeare, and specifically in the Tempest. He refers to this, he has a character quote from this essay. Uh, but, uh, but this is an essay that, that is essentially uh, arguing that the more we learn about the cultures that are, that are distant from us, the more we realize uh, both how, uh, how relative our sense of the absolute nature of our society is and uh, how uncertain we ought to be about the things that we think are good morals. Uh, so so the, the description of this on cannibals, Montaigne talks about this culture where the noble thing is to eat your enemies. Uh, and we all start off thinking, that sounds like a terrible culture, right? But, but the longer he talks about this culture and the way that they, that they eat their enemies in order to show them honor, uh, he, he starts making the case more and more that in fact there's a, there's a real civility to these people that we think are so uncontroversially uncivil uh, that we don't share. If you look at European society at this time, uh, the things that they're doing, in particular, Montaigne's very troubled by what uh, Europeans are doing in the New World to the native populations that they're experiencing. He makes this argument, look, we're the barbarians here. These, these sort of, this, this firm center that we thought we had in sort of our moral uh, high ground is actually uh, no, no firm center at all. And there's real reason to, to question this sense of superiority in our civility that we have. Lots of other folks doing a similar thing at a similar time. I think uh, Gulliver's Travels is another great example of this. Uh, but this question, like, the more we're exposed to the world, the more we start to wonder about the things that we have taken for granted. Again, not only we're not the center of the universe and it's way more complicated than we thought it was, but also we're not the moral center of the universe. We may not be the ones who have the moral high ground. 
Uh, and then uh, there's another essay uh, that he wrote called An Apology for Raymond Seabond. Um, and this is an essay where Montaigne advances a, a much more explicitly skeptical thesis. Uh, and this is a skeptical thesis about, uh, about mainly what we are able to know about God. So, so Montaigne is embracing here what's called fideism, which is the belief that uh, what we ought to do with regards to faith and reason is utterly demarcate them. These are two separate spheres they should never touch. Uh, and he's doing this uh, as much in order to save and preserve faith as anything else. He thinks, look, the more uh, we try to get ourselves into a position where, uh, where we can justify our faith using reason, the more trouble we're going to get ourselves in. We should actually be doing the opposite. We should actually be separating these out as much as possible. Uh, so, so he makes this argument uh, that we can't know anything about God. And not only that, but in the midst of this essay, he's making lots and lots of arguments for how our reason is much more flawed, much less reliable than we thought it was. Um, so, so there's, a, again, a sort of a sense of, oh, we thought we had firm ground when it came to our rational principles. But in fact, this argument that Montaigne is making is saying, yeah, we might not have as much certainty in our rational principles as we thought we did. Okay, so those are four reasons uh, why Locke and Descartes might be doing this project that all have to do with suddenly becoming less sure, right, about what we know, about what we can know. But I actually, I'm, I'm starting to think that that's not as compelling as this next thing which I want to talk about, which is uh, a, real, uh, a real reason or a real reasoning in the minds of Descartes and Locke that goes very much along with them being uh, uh, some of the foundation stones of the Enlightenment. And that's not that they were afraid or pessimistic or worried. It's that they were really optimistic <laughs> about what reason could do if we just got it right. If we just figured out what reason was capable of figuring out, that we could actually set a firm foundation for our knowledge like we've never had before. So here's a, a guy named Carl Becker uh, has described uh, a couple of the things that he takes to be the center of uh, enlightenment. And, and specifically, I'm calling this enlightenment optimism. Uh, so the first premise is man is not natively depraved. Uh, we, we think, or we have thought about man as having this sort of basic uh, error in his system, but the Enlightenment starts to question that. Maybe there's nothing naturally wrong with man. Um, the end of life is life itself, and the good life on earth, instead of a beatific vision after death. Man is capable, guided solely by the light of reason and experience, of perfecting the good life on earth. And the first and essential condition of the good life on earth is the freeing of men's minds from the bonds of ignorance and superstition. So if you look back at Descartes and at Locke from this perspective, there's actually a, a, maybe a very different thing going on from this sort of defensive, oh no, maybe we better f figure out what our ground is. Uh, maybe, maybe we don't know as much as we thought. I actually think that it's much more the case that these guys are thinking, hey, we are finally making progress in science in a way that we have never made progress before. How do we do that? We got a method straight that works for empirical science. Right? So, so there's a long period in which it's not really clear where science ends and magic begins. Uh, but because of a couple of really crucial figures who are establishing a scientific method that's rigorous and that's rational, suddenly science starts taking off and making all kinds of progress with things like lenses, right? So, so the idea is, hey, maybe we can take that same rigorous rational methodology and apply it to philosophy and get the same kinds of results. Maybe all of this uncertainty in terms of what we know and what we don't know has just been a matter of having a bad method. And if we can get the method right, we'll be golden. And we can know things with certainty in a way that we could never know them before. So I think that's actually maybe one of the most important things that's going on right here. Both Descartes and Locke are super optimistic about what reason can accomplish if we just sit down and try to be as rational as we possibly can about which beliefs we can have and which beliefs we can't. Okay, so given that background, uh, now we get into talking a little bit about the meat of these folk and what they do. And I just wanna, I just wanna point out three different facets 
of this set of thinkers. And this is, by the way, kind of an idiosyncratic set of thinkers. If you took an early modern class, you'd probably read some of these folks. You probably wouldn't read Pascal. You probably would read somebody like Berkeley or Spinoza, which we don't read. So, so it's a little bit of an idiosyncratic list. Uh, but just taking these figures, uh, I want to show you a couple of trends, a couple of things that are happening with these figures uh, that'll help you just sort of get, get ground on what this movement is like. Um, now, the first thing, I use lots of fancy words for this. I call it the parallel dialectical movements of rationalism and empiricism. Uh, basically, it's just if you set up Descartes and Locke beside each other, and then you set up Pascal and Hume underneath them, you get a, a parallel movement in these two cases. Uh, so I want to talk about that for a minute, uh, starting with the rationalists, Descartes and Pascal. Uh, so what's rationalism? Uh, this is, you don't get a lot of isms in your actual Tory experience because, of course, the isms are names that we give to things after the people who wrote them are long dead. Uh, so, so here's an ism that you have already learned about once you've done these folks, but now you can go back and talk about it with a name that's been given. Um, rationalism is the view that it emphasizes a reliance on reason. That's the ratio part of it. Um, and, and it basically argues that the resources of reason are sufficient in some sense for what we know. So the resources of reason alone, uh, not on the basis of experience, but just from the inner workings of our mind, we can actually get to knowledge. So they tend to emphasize innate ideas as a starting point for this, the idea that we actually come into the world with some uh, software, not just hardware, right? With, with some actual uh, imprints of knowledge on us. Um, they value certainty over probability. So that's another thing that rationalists tend to do. Um, and then I'll just uh, quote this last bit. Um, rea ra reality, or at least some part of it, has necessary existence. And that necessity is something like logical necessity. So any significant role for sensory experience falls away since what exists can be known a priori by logic alone. I know those of you who have just done Kant got a little shiver when I said the words a priori. I apologize for that. Uh, so, uh, so, so let me just talk you through this a little bit. What's a rationalist? Um, a rationalist is someone who thinks that uh, if we want to be certain uh, going back to some platonic language, we don't get certainty through the realm of becoming. We get certainty through the realm of being, right? So there are things that become. There are things that are constantly changing. Uh, I, I drank water a little while ago, and I'm going to be thirsty again in a little bit, right? There's this constant sort of changing in terms of my relationship to water. Not the same, uh, the relationship between one and two, right? So, so those relationships never change. Those relationships are in this realm of necessary truths, truths that are always true no matter what, as opposed to truths that are constantly changing. So now the question is, how do we know stuff? Uh, and, and especially, how do we know the stuff we know best? So what are, what are the things that I am most certain about when I catalog all of my beliefs and all of my knowledge? Um, and, and how did I get to know those things? A rationalist is going to say the things you know best are going to be necessary things rather than contingent things. And they're going to be things that mostly you actually came pre-programmed with. Uh, and, and the description of which things we come pre-programmed with is famously difficult uh, to, to talk about. Um, some of the ones that I find uh, uh, compelling is uh, there, there are some basic logical truths, right? So uh, a thing can't both be and not be a specific way at a specific time. Uh, if my water bottle is purple, it is not also not purple, right? At the same time in the same respect. That's a truth maybe I don't need to learn, right? Maybe that's a truth that I come pre-programmed with. And if I had to learn it, I might be in a lot of trouble about that. Um, uh, another, another truth is maybe that my senses are telling me things about a world that's outside of me, right? Imagine if you had to learn that. Imagine if you had to find out, rather than just kind of believing automatically, that all of these experiences were about an external world. How could you check, right? How could you find out whether that was true or not? You kind of have to just believe it. And it turns out you do, and you can't stop believing it, so that's nice, right? But it's, it's something that you didn't maybe learn. Maybe it's something that you started with. 
Uh, so these are the kind of things that rationalists lean on, and they say, look, these are actually the foundation, the bedrock of our belief. So for Descartes, famously, the two things he thinks he's most certain of in the world is that he's thinking, which means that he must exist, and that he has an idea of God, which means that God must exist. And I don't want to go into all the logic of why he says that, but do you see how those are both necessary a priori things that he's sort of basing all of his knowledge on? Okay. So, uh, now I want to talk a little bit about the sort of the, the basics that Descartes is leaning on and the way in which Pascal comes and kind of takes a, a swipe at them uh, in, in a very parallel way to, I think, what's going to happen between Locke and Hume. So Descartes comes in with a couple of clear rationalist statements. Everything that can be known about God can be demonstrated by reasoning which has no other source than one's own mind. I am certain that I am a thinking thing. Do I not therefore also know what is required for my being certain about anything? Whatever I perceive very clearly and distinctly is true. So these are some of the fruit of the meditations for Descartes, uh, both that he can know about God using nothing other than the contents of his mind, um, and also that he has, remember we were talking about that bar boundary, how do we demarcate what we know and what we don't know? Uh, so, so Descartes is gonna say, the, the way that he can tell that a belief is true, that it's certain, is that he perceives it clearly and distinctly. He's kind of talking about the sort of internal experience that he has about certain beliefs that he thinks justify them, prove that they're true. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the way that that works for him, um, and that's to give you another, well, it's not an ism, it's an ist. Well, it could be an ism. It just has, happens to be an ist in this situation. Um, and that's that uh, Descartes is a foundationalist. Uh, so there are a couple of different models for how our beliefs relate to each other. Uh, have you ever talked to a three-year-old uh, and, and you say, you know, they ask you a question and you give an answer and they say, why? And so then you have to give another answer, and then they say, why? <laughs> another answer, and you say, why? Um, and at a certain point, you reach a bedrock where you have to say, because. Uh, <laughs> because it turns out that that's, that's maybe the way that your beliefs work. That's, the, that's what a foundationalist thinks, is that's actually the structure of your beliefs, uh, is that you have all kinds of beliefs that you believe on the basis of other things, but that there are a couple of bedrock beliefs that you don't believe on the basis of anything else. You believe those beliefs in a way that is, sometimes we talk about them being self-evident, so they, they give justification for themselves. Um, there are other ways to talk about it too. Um, but the idea is that there are some beliefs that you don't have a further reason to believe, you just believe them. And those beliefs, which are hopefully certain, are gonna then produce the foundation for everything else. So that's the project of the meditations, right? Is Descartes trying to find a couple of foundational beliefs that he can build a whole edifice of beliefs onto once he knows a couple of things that he can be certain of that don't rely on anything else. Does that make sense? Do you understand that as a, as a model? Okay, so here's uh, Pascal taking a swipe. Uh, so, <laughs> so Descartes is going to argue something like, uh, we can get certainty, we can get this certain knowledge, um, and the way that we do that is we start with these first principles, these axiomatic beliefs that don't have any other justification but themselves, um, and we identify them by this experience of clarity and distinctness we have when we, when we think about them. So those are certain. Um, that sentence isn't grammatical, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so those are certain, and, uh, and those are the basis of all of the rest of our beliefs. Uh, notice I used the word axiomatic there, another really helpful way of thinking about this. How many of you remember doing proofs in geometry? So both Descartes and Pascal are great geometers. Uh, they're, they're really excellent mathematicians, and both, both of their fields are, are geometry. So they really understand the model for a geometric proof, uh, which is what? What do you start with with a geometric proof? You start with an axiom, right? You start with, you start with a proposition that you know that you don't have to prove. And then you reason from that axiom down to whatever other proof you want to make, right? But if you didn't have any axioms, you couldn't do a geometrical proof. So this model for knowledge that both Descartes and Pascal buy into is a geometrical model for knowledge. They're both thinking about it like they would think about a geometric proof. But here's the difference. So Descartes says, oh yeah, no, I've thought about it, and these, these foundational beliefs that I have, 
I have rationally justified them. I've given myself proof that these are certain, and so all of the rest of my knowledge can be built up on the basis of them, and all of my knowledge can be perfectly certain. But Pascal's gonna come in, and he's gonna say, okay, yeah, you do have these initial propositions you start off with in your mind that you can't doubt, you can't get away from. Things like, the, the, my, my senses are telling me truths about the world outside of me. Time moves linearly forward. Space has three dimensions. It's true. You can't doubt those. You have to believe them. Just give it a try. Try believing that space doesn't have three dimensions. Just, it, it, I don't care how long you try. I don't care how much work you do on yourself. That turns out to be incorrigible. That's a belief you can't stop having. But Pascal says, the mere fact that I have that belief and that I experience it clearly and distinctly doesn't tell me anything about its reliability. It just tells me that it's something that's been built into my hardware. So here's the quote. Um, we can in no way be sure of the truths of these principles apart from faith and revelation, except that we feel them to be natural to us. Now this natural feeling is not a convincing proof of their truth, since having no certainty apart from faith about whether we were created by a, benev a benevolent God, an evil demon, or by chance, it's open to doubt whether the principles given to us are true, false, or uncertain, depending on our origins. So this is actually an interesting thing to think about. This has, this has relation to contemporary philosophy. Um, there are Christian philosophers who have argued recently that evolution creates real problems for science uh, because if my mechanisms, if my, specifically my belief forming mechanisms have been created by an evolutionary process, rather than by a, a god, uh, say. Uh, what's true about my belief forming processes is that they're not gonna be directed towards me having true beliefs necessarily. What are they gonna be directed towards? Good, they're, they're gonna cause me to form beliefs that have a survival advantage, right? So it turns out that if you want science to be about finding the truth rather than about surviving, you've got a problem if you believe in evolution because we don't have any evidence that our faculties are set up well for that. Our faculties are probably set up pretty badly for that actually. They're probably set up to cause a lot of, I don't know, you know self-deception or whatever it's gonna take in order for me to continue to survive and thrive. So it's, a, so it's an interesting sort of contemporary example of exactly what Pascal is saying, which is, hey, wait a minute, these instincts, these fundamental beliefs that I start with, turns out I can't know that they're, that they're taking me towards the truth unless I know where they come from. And I can't know where they come from on the basis of them, right? <laughs> so, so Descartes gonna say, oh, no, but I know that God exists. Well, how do you know that God exists? On the basis of these first principles, right? On the basis of these, these uh, intuitions that you have about what seems clear and distinct to you. But if it turns out that what seems clear and distinct to you does because of some chance operation of evolution, it doesn't give you any evidence to believe that God actually exists just because it seems real certain in your mind that he does. Okay, so swipe number one. Uh, and swipe number two goes back to that description of enlightenment that I talked to you about. So remember, one of the first tenets of the enlightenment is man is not fundamentally sinful. Um, and so, so take a look at what Descartes has to say towards the end of the meditations. Um, I know by experience that there is within me a faculty of judgment, which I certainly received from God. And since God does not wish to deceive me, he surely did not give me the kind of faculty which would ever enable me to go wrong while using it correctly. So this is Descartes' uh, understanding of his own internal processes. My, my faculty of judgment, because it is made by God, is totally reliable as long as I use it well. Well, that's, I mean, that, that would be great. Right? <laughs> um, but notice how that doesn't seem to take into account the possibility that there's actually been a, a break between what I was created to be able to do and what I now am able, able to do in the position of having sinned. So this is the second swipe that Pascal's gonna take, is saying maybe actually human beings, because we are under the position of experiencing and being influenced by original sin, are having a lot of problems understanding and, and using our judgment rightly. Um, so, so this is a, another quote from Pascal. Humans are simply a subject of natural error which cannot be eradicated without grace. Nothing points them towards truth and everything deceives them. Uh, 
So, so uh, coming back uh, just sort of to a, to a bigger picture here, here we've got sort of the, the flagship rationalist, Descartes. He's trying to sort of launch this enlightenment project for how we can come to certain knowledge if we just get our methods straight. And here comes a rationalist that's actually contemporary to him. Pascal's about 30 years younger than Descartes. Uh, and immediately he's going to bring in a couple of reasons to doubt, primarily by talking about the fact that maybe evil is a, a reality in the world, right? As, a, as opposed to this sort of optimistic enlightenment. And maybe uh, your method for finding certainty isn't as certain as he thought it was, right? Uh, so, so that's uh, Descartes and Pascal. Uh, almost the same thing happens on the other side with Locke and Hume. Uh, so uh, what's empiricism, this other camp? Uh, empiricism just means that insofar as we have knowledge in our subject, our knowledge is a posteriori. Sorry again, those of you who are cringing because of your Kant post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, uh, and, uh, and everything is dependent upon sense experience. So a priori, a posteriori just means, what's, what, what does the word prior mean? Before. Where is your posterior? Behind you, right? So, uh, so if... Uh, so if we're talking about things that are a priori, they're prior to experience. A posteriori are after experience. So the idea here is the firm foundation of our knowledge isn't these innate ideas. It's not things that we come pre-programmed with. The firm foundation of our knowledge is our experience. And it's through our experience that we gradually build up to understanding these more general propositions like a thing can't both be purple and not purple at the same time, et cetera. Okay, uh, so here's Locke uh, being a good empiricist and being a good optimistic empiricist. Um, he's going to talk about here how we can come to know these more general principles on the basis of our experience. So he's going to say, um, say, say we have a specific triangle that we're looking at. And when we look at that specific triangle, uh, we know that, uh, I don't know, it's just my, what, is, what is the example? Something about equal angles. Um, the, that, that same thing that we learn about that particular triangle, we in that moment are also going to learn about triangles generally. So we, so we can get all of our knowledge on the basis of our sensory experience just by extrapolating from the individual to the general. Uh, this is one of the first things that uh, Hume's going to poke at when he comes in after Locke. Uh, he's going to say uh, specifically the uniformity of nature um, is, is something that we believe in, not because we have any justification for it, uh, but simply because it's, it's useful. So those of you who have read Hume, uh, the, the one that he talks about is cause and effect. That's, a, that's another one of these general laws we're supposed to be able to extrapolate from individual experience. Uh, so I hit a billiard ball and it hits another one and it goes into the corner pocket. Almost never, but say that happened to me once. Um, <laughs> so, so Locke's going to say, oh yeah, I can actually, just on the basis of my a posteriori experience, I can learn about the laws that govern pool tables uh, and about the laws that govern physics generally as a relation to that. Uh, Hume's going to say, that's nice, Locke, but actually uh, you didn't observe a law of causal relationship there. All you observed is an event followed by another event. And it turns out that that event, that, one, that first event, gets followed by that second event a lot. But uh, if the next time you hit one billiard ball into another one, rather than going into the corner pocket or not, it turned into a chicken, uh, it, that actually wouldn't be any more surprising or shouldn't be any more surprising to you on the basis of your knowledge of laws, because you can't observe the laws at, at work. You've only gotten into the habit of experiencing one event being followed by another event. That's all observation can get you. If you want to get to laws, you're going to have to get to that some other way, and you've just excluded any other way. You've just said all of our knowledge comes from experience. So it turns out, rather than knowing any universal law, all I can know is that something happens a bunch. It's a little bit like, have you, have you ever heard of the black swan problem? This is a sort of classic problem in philosophy. So say, I've seen 30 swans and every single one of them was white. And you've seen 12 swans and they were all white. And you've seen 34 swans and they were all white. And we pull everybody in the room, we pull everybody in the world, and everybody who's ever seen a swan has seen a white swan. But there is one swan walking around in the jungles of South Africa 
right? That's black. What's the problem? The rule, swans are white, turns out not to be a rule. And no amount of experience can prove to us that swans are white as a rule. Do you see how that works? That kind of knowledge, the kind of knowledge that we get purely from experience, doesn't get us laws, and basically can't get us laws because our experience is never of everything. Our experience is always limited. Does that make sense? Okay, so empiricists have a problem with laws. Uh, Locke thinks he can get us there. I mean, this is so ironic because Locke's the guy who invented, well, not invented, but who's the, sort of the modern proponent of natural law theory, right? He thinks that governments can be, can be created on the basis of these observable natural laws. Hume says, you're crazy. All you've got is individual experiences. All you've got is a room full of white swans. You just don't know what else is out there. Okay, um, and then similarly, remember how uh, Descartes was sort of forgetting the fact that humans might or might not be completely corrupted? Uh, <laughs> Locke and Hume have the same problem. Uh, so Locke is one of these, it, it, what, what I think, I, I'm just going to say this, I'm pretty sure that this is mostly uncontroversial, that Locke is a deist, um, which means that... Uh, it's just these, these claims are always so debatable because it's not like he has in his journal somewhere, I am a deist, right? Um, uh, I, I think it is mostly uncontroversial to call Locke a deist. Um, uh, and, and according to deism, so this is a quote, um, nature is the work of God and man is the product of nature. So man and all that man does and thinks are in harmony with the laws of nature and thus in harmony with God. So this is going back to this natural law theory that, path, or that, that Locke is suggesting for politics. He's saying, hey, uh, it's possible for us to get our, our government sort of in, in coherence with the law of nature, uh, these natural laws that exist, and then we will have a government that, is, that, that works, that is sort of in harmony with the way things ought to be. Hume's going to come back in with almost the same objection that Pascal has, except this time with regards to uh, evil more generally. And he's going to say, we can never have reason to infer any attributes or any principles of action in the divinity, but so far as we have known them to have been exerted and satisfied. And basically, if we look at the world around us, we see that the world is full of evil. It's full of suffering, it's full of pain, it's full of sin. Uh, if all we're going on in terms of figuring out what God is like is what we see around us in creation, we just can't believe that he's this harmonious and perfect being. Uh, so again, there's this sort of, there's this check on uh, enlightenment idealism that we see with these immediate predecessors of these flagship uh, enlightenment empiricists and rationalists. Okay, and it's 818 and I have like lots of slides left, so we're gonna do this real quick. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, I, I just want to talk to you about two parallel slides that kind of happen. So this is a second structural point about how the Enlightenment ends up looking, or how the, how the early modern uh, epistemology ends up looking. Uh, in, in two different respects, with respect to these universal laws and also with respect to these uh, sort of individual experiences, we're going to see a slide uh, amongst the early modern philosophers from a position that says, I can know these things with certainty, and they are true of the world outside of myself, down to a position that says, I have no idea whether these truths are true outside of my own head. Okay, so that's gonna happen twice, once with regards to universals, once with regards to particulars. Um, so with regards to universals, uh, here's the thing about Descartes talking about how he thinks universals are true of the world outside of ourselves. I promise you that he says that. Uh, here's Pascal saying, uh, saying, yeah, maybe these universals that we have as our, as, as our internal experience, maybe these are true of the world outside of ourselves. We can only know that by first believing that God is being faithful because the re reason why we have these inside of ourselves is because of our maker. So, so yes, I do have access to the external world and yes, it is the way that I think it is according to these intuitive posi positions that I have in my mind. But the only way I can be certain about that is because of faith. Okay, Locke again is going to say, I can actually extrapolate these universals on the basis of my own personal experience of like individual instances of them. So once again, once I've seen the way that something works with the triangle I'm looking at, I can see the way the thing works with triangles generally. So I can get access to these universals through particulars. 
Hume's going to say, yeah, not so much. Uh, you, all you have in terms of understanding these universals, in terms of understanding these laws, is your habits. And hopefully your habits are truth-directed, but we're going to have to start thinking about what laws are very differently if we're going to talk about getting laws on the basis of experience. They're not going to be these metaphysical relationships anymore. They're just going to be what's always happened as far as we know, which is very different. Uh, and then, finally, Kant, who I have almost not talked about yet, but who's definitely the cherry on the top of this particular little cake, is going to say, uh, actually, what you thought were laws that you could observe in nature outside of yourself are just facets of your own mind. So it turns out your belief that time moves linearly forward and that that's necessarily true is because when your mind experiences external stimuli, it organizes them according to an internal principle that tells it that time is moving linear linearly forward. Same thing with space. So, so these principles that we think we're experiencing in the outside world are actually just organizational frameworks within our own minds. Same thing is going to happen with regards to our sensory experiences. So Descartes, once he's established that God exists and is trustworthy, says, I can have absolute certainty that the things that I experience with my, with my senses are true. Pascal says, I'm not going to be able to doubt them, but God is reliable. Uh, Locke says, these are the basis for my knowledge of the world. Hume says, I might not be able to see all the things that I think I can see. And then Kant says, actually, I have no access <laughs> uh, to the world outside of myself. Um, because of these, what I was talking about before, because of these paradigmatic uh, facets of my mind, so these paradigms that my mind imposes on the world outside of me, uh, all I can know is, is the world of appearances. I can never know the world of reality. So if you've ever heard the words noumenal and phenomenal, right? I can know the phenomenon of, exist, of, of the external world, which is to say the way that the external world appears to me. But the noumenal world, the world in itself outside of my particular uh, uh, sort of cognitive framework, is something that's totally inaccessible to me. So do you see this, this sort of gradual shrinking in uh, both Descartes and Locke start by saying, like, we can get certainty about everything. Um, and then it's like 200 years later that suddenly the only thing that we can have certainty about, and in fact the only thing that we can have real knowledge about, is what things appear to be to us. The way that things seem to be to us. Uh, so I'm going to read you a couple of quotes, uh, sort of what happened next quotes. Um, so, so the first one is that um, Hume skepticism seemed to result in what later in the century Kant would call a philosophical scandal. Reality seemed to dissolve into appearance and knowledge into mere opinion. There occurred a gradual shift in emphasis from the mathematical sciences, which are all about these necessary laws, to experimentation and the sciences dealing with the origin and evolution of the physical order. A shift which stemmed as much from doubt about the existence of an objectively real and rationally necessary universe as it did from confidence in the existence of such a universe. Um, and then one more quote from you, uh, and this is, uh, Descartes' rationalism, Locke's empiricism, the skepticism of Pierre Bale, who we also haven't talked about, all contributed to an undermining of men's confidence in the past as a guide to, pre to action in the present. This loss of confidence in history, while it paved the way for the Enlightenment doctrine of progress, also generated widespread skepticism and cynicism between 1680 and 1715. So uh, as you think about the world that you live in today, one of the reasons why I get a little bit uh, grumpy uh, when, when I get the objection from students, why do we have to read these empiricists? Why do we have to read these rationalists? Does epistemology matter? I want to read about something that matters. Uh, I, I get a little bit annoyed <laughs> because uh, when I look at the world around me today, when I look at sort of the main fights that Christians are uh, engaged in today in the world, I think almost all of them end up stemming back to this question of what is our access to a real world outside of ourselves, right? So, so if you've ever been to a, a Josh McDowell seminar about how morals are objectively true and there's no such thing as a moral that is true for me and not true for you, right? That's, that's an early modern epistemological fallout, right? This idea that something can be true for me and true for you comes from this sort of gradual reigning in of what we think we can know, where it started being, I think I can know that there is a carpet here, to 
I think I can know that I am experiencing the phenomenon of a carpet here, right? That, that distance gets bridged uh, in the early epistemologist and then starts getting sort of walked back and back and back until the only thing I have access to is what exists in my own mind. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.